so I delete my anyway, and then I was late and then I wanted to watch some football. But uh well at the end it worked and I watched it a little bit. Good. That's okay, but then I woke up at like five. Uh, I uh, I went over everything a couple of times as well, and then after that, I could kind of relax.
Hey, hi, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we're very glad to have you here um, from all over the world and here on site. Um, my name is Babajide Oyele, and I'm privileged to present um, the introduction to the bootcamp uh, to you. So the Envision Bootcamp is conceived as a hands-on introduction to multimodal signal analysis techniques so that participants can gain qualitative and quantitative understanding of team dynamics. So it's a three-day event uh, that I would introduce the host uh, later to you, but a very warm welcome. It's cold winter. Uh, we hope that at the comforts of your home, you're doing well and you have a hot tea, hot cup of coffee to, to go on this journey with us in the next three days. So again, my name is Mavaji Deoyele. I'm going to be introducing uh, the bootcamp, the big agenda, the ideas that we have in mind for what you would possibly learn. Um, I could already start with a, uh, a very, very generic statement that you will hear a lot during this event. All sections are recorded. So if you miss anything, don't we'll share the links. So a very warm welcome from our side. We're here as a Blackner Institute here in Potsdam, and we have all the hosts uh, on site also with some more coming in the next two days. Um, not out at the moment. Um, so everything will be recorded. <laughs> everything will be recorded. How could we make multimodal analysis accessible to designers? So traditionally here at the Hasblattner Institute, my colleague Joachim and Dr. Oderman, we are into design. For us, it was always about how can multimodal analysis benefit the design community? And subsequently, when we met with other hosts, we extended that to researchers. And so the goal is to leverage the ambition data set, which, which will also be introduced to you during the three days, and state of the art methods moving beyond this qualitative data divide. So the Envision Bootcamp, we're welcoming you again, is our first reflection slash answer to this question, uh, because we believe teams and understanding collaboration is the engine for, for true transformation. Um, you know, in your personal work, in your research, we've asked a lot of participants for challenges. Multimodal analysis is not accessible. It's complex. It's a wicked puzzle. It's a grand challenge. A lot of money, time, and effort goes into data sets, uh, but yet these data sets are not really maximized. They're underused. Um, so we hope that um, this bootcamp would be one of the associations where you can get insights into uh, dealing with multimodal analysis and that puzzle. So the data set is from Stanford University, a dissertation uh, work by Dr. Edelman. And now we are looking at how computer vision, NLP, machine learning, um, multi -signal, multimodal signal analysis techniques can be used to perform analysis in less the fraction of time and cost that Jonathan used uh, for his dissertation. Um, so together, we hope that you can join us in this journey. Uh, it's a start. Um, my supervisor, also, uh, Professor Gerard, yesterday I had a talk with him. You would meet him later today. He's having a talk. He said, yeah, it's, it's more of a bootstrap than a, than a boot camp. Uh, so I think I would I'll just invite you to adopt that, that mindset with us. Uh, it's a boot camp, but we're also bootstrapping this. Um, and it was with the great support of many hosts. Um, the event was supported by, by the NVO in, in Holland and by the Hasselblattner Foundation. Uh, these are the hosts. So I'm Baba Jide. There's uh, Wim in the audience. You would get to hear a lot from him and, and James. Uh, Jonathan will be talking about his uh, uh, data set, how that all started, the crazy idea uh, to recall teams and, and decades after we are able to access that. Uh, Ola um, Alexandra, as she prefers to be called, is my um, facilitating colleague. Um, she would also be giving a short introduction to the agenda in detail in coming minutes. So Hakim will be also having a session later on Friday uh, to see how we can explore generating um, more research questions and, and getting insights from the data set. Uh, Gerard is also here um, with us, but he would have to join in a bit later. So those are the hosts. So if you have any questions internally in the chat or, or just directly emails, um, you can ask these people. 
Um, these are the guest lectures we are having, uh, very packed, very intense, very recent state of the art talks. Um, so Gerard will be giving us some insights about AI, computer vision, machine learning, and how that could be used to augment research on the vision data set. Andrea Franzetti Coladon would arrive from Italy um, with Ludovica, his PhD student, um, this evening. So they will be talking about semantic network analysis. Um, Manoj uh, Prabhakar Kanan Ravi is a, also a, a privileged PhD colleague of mine. He's a PhD student of Gerard also. He'll be giving a talk on Spacey, how to use Spacey, the NLP tool for um, making sense of the, the Envision data set. Um, I will read Dr. Wolfgang Maas um, giving us a talk on how to blend data-driven approaches uh, with theory-driven approaches. So a very, very intense meta framework um, will be coming our way on Friday. Um, through Wim and James, we were introduced to Daniel Dominic Hudson, who has a, also a special hands-on package that he has developed a multi-sync Pi, a Python package for also exploring how we could uh, make sense of the vision data set. Um, again, the recordings will be available. So if for some reason you missed out on a few lines of code um, or your internet just breaks out a bit, or for some reason you just have a a slight thought that you wanted to think about, but it wasn't related to the ambition, you can always go back to the recordings after the event. So again, the recordings are available. There's no need to be tensed or stressed. You will catch everything up uh, either daily or after the event. I will now invite Ola to just quickly run us through the um, agenda of the three days. It's nice to see you all here. And uh, we have three participants joining here and many of you, oh, I see, I think 35 people, not some of the cameras here. So I'm really glad you made it and I'm really happy that we got this started. I'm just gonna skim through the agenda. You've all got like final program version two. So you know how it is when you submit papers, there are always like seven final versions. And this was the case in our agenda. So you can feel that it might, switch a little, you see we got a little problems in the beginning. Uh, so after this introduction, Jonathan is going to introduce you to the Envision data set that he collected for his PhD. And we're gonna have a coffee break. So um, those of you at home, I hope you can make a decent cup of coffee or tea, right? And we also can have a warm beverage here uh, in Potsdam. And uh, then we're going to meet again and start working with multimodal data. So Wim and James are going to start by giving an overview to signal processing, then uh, going to, uh, to the introduction of video motion tracking. So there are these various systems and going to show you everything. Don't worry. I also don't follow all of them. Luckily, we're recording everything. So uh, I'm sure I will be coming back to those videos. Uh, in the following months, days, or years. Then we're going to have a lunch break, and we're going to come back to some more multimodal data analysis together. And then we, I think we deserve a coffee break. Um, and then Gerard is going to join us with some um, introduction on deep learning, AI, and machine learning. And you see that we prolonged uh, the program a little bit. Of course, we understand that you may not be able to adjust your schedules, but we hope that we can all together enjoy a like a q a session like a get together uh, because we just want to uh, to share so much with you and also gain your input that's why we decided to take this bold step so this is this is going to be tomorrow um we're going to have a fast uh, recap 15 minutes with baba and um, so here you see a little mistake even uh, the, the program is changing so rapidly so we're actually going to be doing open face and kinematic features with James in the morning. Then we will have a coffee break. And then we will jump in with him and, and James to the multivariate module. And what this is, you're going to find out tomorrow. Uh, after that, we're going to have a lunch break. And uh, Vim is going to share some stuff about the gesture network. After that, I think we need some time to, to digest. So we're going to have a Q&A joint with a coffee break. And uh, Andrea from Italy, um, Baba also mentioned, 
he's going to um, talk to us about the semantic network analysis. And again, we have some time for a wrap up and some questions after the session. Okay. On Friday, uh, we're going to have a recap again. Um, and then a fun session with Joaquin, I think. It was some brainstorming. Uh, on Envision data. So by then, I think you will get a, a gist of what this data is, and you're going to be able to develop your own ideas, uh, how to analyze things you have learned by then. And we're going to have a small technical break, and uh, we're going to jump in with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Spacey for, for Envision, so a little bit more programming. And um, we're going to have a lunch break. And then uh, Professor Maas is gonna tell us something that I at least feel is very important, data-driven versus theory-driven research. And I think doing multimodal data, this is something also very crucial for us. Um, followed by a coffee break and some more Python, why not? Uh, <laughs> and after this, this day that's gonna begin with brainstorming, I think we can sit together and maybe develop some research questions, of course, Thought, thinking about the Envision data set, but also thinking about your own interests, your own data, and together in this, I hope we're going to create a warm and, um, and nice research environment so that you can go out and do some more research. January is ahead, right? So we're in December now, but with New Year come new powers. And I hope that it's going to be a good booster for you for the next year. And we're going to wrap up with some reflections and more Q&A. And then Unfortunately, we're going to say goodbye, but we stay in, uh, in touch, of course. Uh, we, you see the recordings, you see the modules online. So we're very happy to stay in touch with you as well. That's it for the agenda. And for the word back to Baba. Yeah, Thank so you. again, all recordings will be clear. I cannot say that enough. Um, um, how to navigate everything? Well, this is kind of our everything. Three things kind of come together. So you can always look at the website, um, tfast.org. That link will take you there. It looks long now, but when you click it, it will take you to the tfast.org slash envision. Um, for detail, you can go to this GitHub page to access the code live. It's always there. We will not be making any drastic updates yet, but um, maybe after you give us some critical feedback, and you have 12 questions, then we, we upgrade them. To create some engagement with you from Japan, from Bielefeld, from all over the world, we created a mural space where you can already dive in now, click it, uh, we can give you, I think we have automatic access. And there you can also start to submit your challenges. We got some already, all up, but it would be nice for you to have some so that the people who give the bootcamp instructions can also factor in some of your, your challenges uh, while they work. Um, we're going to take a poll on how many people have installed everything. So Anaconda, GitHub, um, the, the uh, repository or downloaded the zip file, but we, we hope that you, you have done that. If you have not done it, um, to take off really well on this first day um, and to not come crashing down um, with a lot of regrets with how intense this uh, next few hours are going to be, um, please try and set that up. Uh, so download the, you will have the, you can also see more details in the GitHub page. So again, a very welcome from our side. Thank you to our sponsors, Hazard Platinum Foundation, the Research to Impact Group, and uh, NVO. Now I hand over to Wim, James, for the technical introduction. We hope you are still giving us your attention. Thank you very much.
Python or whatever. Um, start again? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, let's start again. Um, we um, Part of the Envision Bootcamp is um, the Envision Toolbox. And what we intended is that uh, we have these coding modules that are self contained. You have a sample a video or some process or maybe pictures you want to pro progress uh, uh, process and we uh, are uh, we have uh, code that takes that and processes that in a way and also presents it in a notebook kind of way that uh, you know uh, how to do it yourself so um, specifically we see it as a gateway into coding if you have not started yet or you're at a particular level we want to have different modules at different kind of skill levels. One thing as a cognitive scientist, you have to be, uh, James and I are cognitive scientists. And one thing what you often um, find out is that you need to be good at everything, right? You need to have uh, coding skills, you have to read writing skills. And it's really difficult to keep up with all this stuff, right? It's difficult to keep up with the progress in, in computer science right now. And so one thing that would really help is we, if we help each other out. Instead of working on our own domains in our little islands, writing our code that barely hangs together let's work on it together and make it better and, and share it with each other um and um yeah that's that's thing i think the the basis of the envision toolbox it's just started we just are going to do a few modules but we really want to uh invite uh collaboration i'll go into that a little bit later so the current modules are more focused on processing in anything else right there is a lot of hypothesis testing um, that you might already be uh, using cognitive science, you get a lot of hypothesis testing, but less signal processing, and we will fo focus more on the processing of uh, uh, multimodal data. Um, and we're open to collaborations. If, if you look at the, at the um, uh, GitHub page, which I will go through now quickly, uh, is that where we actually invite people to participate. Um, and if you want to participate, I'm going to do you share the screen or I'm going to share my screen here. Um, um, I, I am disabled. But if you, for example, think this code can be improved in some way, and I'm sure it can, uh, then you can uh, actually say, well, uh, you can contact us and say, well, maybe I want to contribute or I want to add something, or you want to create your own module altogether. Uh, because there are, for example, now already within the participants, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of different ex uh, people with different expertise, right? And um, that's something uh, that we want to uh, capitalize on. So this is the GitHub page, um, that, um, which I am, should be sharing now. This is the GitHub page, right? Um, this is a little intro with some links. And just to give you a sense of the, of the the, um, if you just want to see what kind of modules we have, we have GitHub pages, which is here, and then you can have all these modules, right? For example, here is an uh, amplitude envelope in R, and the general structure is like this. We even have a reference. So what if you would make your own module? You'll just have your own reference here, on here, so you can be a knowledge for the work that you're doing, right? So we can also envisage that everybody just contributes your model, and we have a particular website kind of citation for it. Well, this is not the actual code, right? This is just an overview of the notebooks that we generated. Um, and if we back to um, pages, this is actually where our kind of... I'm not sure if you've already done so. You can um, uh, download uh, the repository like, like this. So download it as a zip file, for example or you can pull it when you're using a, a git pull, or you can use GitHub desktop, for example. Um, the docs is where our website pages live. Um, it's here. And um, so you don't need to look in that, into that. The Python is where our Python modules live, and you can actually uh, inspect them, and you can um, The, 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 um, another thing is that uh, what is important is that um, also just the notebooks itself can be helpful, right? It's not even, maybe you don't even care about multimodal analysis, but you do want to have a more open science kind of way. I have, I've written my manuscripts in these kind of notebook space, right? 
So it's one way to make something computational re uh, reproducible as well. And anything that you can reuse, just use it. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, free to use. Um, so we, uh, in R, you have the R modules uh, and you have the particular code for that. And in the, for example, for R Marto, you open the R. R. This is actually where the text lives and our code is uh, um, where you can use the code and open it. Uh, and we go later, later we will go into uh, how to open this, and, uh, actually uh, play with it in a way that you processing it yourself. Um, any other things? I think uh, we are there, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, thanks. Dreams for that technical intro. Um, again, we're recording, so you can always hear whatever you did not pick up subsequently. Um, very special to me personally, because the person speaking has been a friend and a mentor to me. When I first started research, when I conceived okay, I'm gonna try and figure out what I would do in research. And that is uh, going to be uh, um, I would change how I see the word accessibility, um, how to make something accessible. Um, you can always question it every time. Um, so, his data set was a sample of that, um, the kind of collaborations we worked on uh, here at HBI is an example of that. Um, I've learned so much from him um, on and off record. And uh, I, I think that this session would give a bit of a grounding to why we are adopting this keyword accessibility of multimodal analysis and the ambition data set. Um, so he's going to give a very short talk on uh, how he, uh, his research, the origins of the data set. Um, he is adjunct professor here at the Dito Health Center that has a Platinum Institute and a visiting professor in several. Um, and he has also been a director of the design program at the Imperial College, Royal College of Arts. Um, Mechanical engineering from Stanford University. Um, the, I would just give the floor to Dr. Edelman to present the ambition data set. Um, thank you. Good, very um, generous. All right, I have to speak. I've been told I must speak like a Roman orator, or else the microphone will shut off. So, uh, thank you, Baba, um, for that lovely introduction, generous introduction. I want to say I think I'm one of the luckiest people in the world to work with. Uh, Baba and Joaquin. Um, oh. There's no muscle behind this. Um, I'm very, very grateful 
for everybody's incredible genius and commitment to this, even louder. Wow. I feel like I need a megaphone. Today. Can everybody see uh, this? Is it up? Good. Okay. Um, told you about me. So um, I study teams at work. Um, and I have to say that we study teams at work. And we capture data about design team interactions through video recordings and transcripts. And my work began at Stanford. Uh, I had uh, been a a master's student in design program, uh, incidentally on the art side, in a joint program with engineering. And um, there was so much that didn't seem right to me about how uh, what our understanding of teams were. I had worked um, uh, uh, in a national level in judo and was convinced that the type of techniques we used in judo could be used for team, and, and other teams could be used in understanding teams and training teams in design. Uh, again, the research was funded by the Hassel Platner Design Thinking Research Program and Stanford's Product Realization Lab. And I was able to devote um, several years to this, five, six years to this to begin with. Um, one of my friends, Larry Leifer, who is the head of the uh, Center for Design Research at Stanford, said, designing is a performance of a corpus of behaviors. You have to watch what designers do to learn about how design is done. Um, a very ground up approach. My dissertation in 2011, submitted it, and it was about media and behavior in small teams engaged in redesign scenarios. Uh, I was interested in how do they come up with radically new concepts? What, how did that work? What happened? And uh, I was concentrating on the interaction of behaviors and media, but of course there was a lot of language involved also. So it was multimodal even before I knew what that was. Um, this group actually introduced me to the notion of multimodal. But we didn't have any computer analysis. It was available, but you had to be a computer scientist, really advanced stuff at the time. And um, now it's become more accessible was to deepen and raise the level of discourse about design in the design community, so to bring into parity with contemporary discourse and adjacent fields. And it was to challenge and examine dogmas in design practice. People were talking one way, but it didn't really make sense. Um, I'm happy to say that my research group now has brought that to a whole new level. I'm very proud of the work that they're doing. Formulation of process is no longer acceptable in a profession. It doesn't mean anything. It is not a process. Right? It doesn't work. It's nonsense. And instead, we look at questions like, for me, I started out, it was very personal. How can I get better at this? How can I be better? And teaching design, I added other questions. What characterizes the craft of design? How can I teach the mechanisms of team interactions? And that's puzzled me and intrigued me. And again, I'm lucky to have a research group who can look into this and bring so much uh, knowledge and the engine of complex system of innovation. And team performance is a critical factor. And my focus is on developing technical skills that build highly effective team interactions. This means looking at what great teams do, breaking it down, and then teaching that, right? This is both theoretical and practical. That's what are often tacit in internal workings of an individual designer. I, I'm not sold completely on teams. I think people do fabulous work by themselves, but teams reveal things because they have to interact and externalize. The 
The goal of the research is to access highly effective performative patterns. That is, you want me here? Yes, back to oh, the microphone. I better yeah. carry this then. Okay. Great. I can do this. <laughs> it's a whole new way. Um, highly effective performative patterns are the micro interactions that are the nuts and bolts of how teams work. And um, in fact, we have transdisciplinary foundations. We have cognitive science, we have archeology, span media studies, anthropology, systems engineering, science, technology, sports, music, design theory, and methodology all come together in trying to understand how multidisciplinary teams work together and how they interact. There's two cognitive models. One is extended cognition, the other is distributed cognition. For our purposes, extended cognition is that within a single person, thinking is, well, it wouldn't be within them, but thinking for a single person, thinking is a loop that has to do with their mind, their bodies, how they move, and the media, the tools that they use. And this is a loop. These are feedback loops of different kinds. Distributed cognition is thinking is distributed amongst people, objects, et cetera. So it's actually broken up. And so our approach has been to go very radically towards extended cognition, embracing that and distributed cognition in the same way that it happens here. This is a, an American football team, a college team, Alabama, which just trounced uh, Texas. Uh, uh, it was kind of remarkable, but this is an older game. Now, if you watch this video, if you didn't know football, you'd think that it's just a bunch of big guys and patting, shoving each other around and throwing a ball and someone catches it. But there's a method here and it's called a play. And this is the four verticals play. And when we watch this, you're gonna see that it's this vertical that catches the ball, okay? Because things move around a lot. Things are very, uh, uh, shall we say volatile, Chan you have to have multiple avenues to go somewhere. And in fact, each receiver here, the quarterback is here, has multiple ways of going. Now, what this does, this requires informed structure and intuitive movement. This is a performative pattern and it's a container for improvisation, inv invention and execution that's unfolding in the moment. It allows the team to read one another. Receivers can read the defense and make choices within certain parameters. And the quarterback can read the field to see what kind of choices they make, release a ball to a place nobody is in order to make a catch. It also breaks up the action. No one person is doing all the work here. It is in the mind in terms of event schemas. It is in the body in terms of running throwing, catching, blocking, avoiding. And it's in the ball. It's fully extended. So when we look at teams, teams have not been in design, they have not been trained this way, but they could be. So there is a method to the madness of what seems to be chaos if we look at what successful teams do and then formalize that. In team-based design, a performance pattern is a set of defined iterative interactions that serve as a container for previously undefined content. And this is what we've been looking for. And then to formalize them. So the data set was done this way. Okay. We gave teams this. And it says the object in front of you allows the identification of the material object, a composition of objects, redesign it. It took several years to get to that formulation, but it didn't just fall off the tree. Every time we gave someone, we gave groups uh, uh, prompts, they would go off in some direction. We have to go, oh, that's because we said this. And we were looking for a very, very straightforward thing. And we gave them this uh, engineering drawing of basically what's a, a handheld spectrum. And uh, we got videos and you can see that, um, uh, they're trading gestures here. 
And we had to code all this by hand, by eye, by hand, on computers. Engineering drawing. And then after five minutes, we gave some groups a cardboard puck, some groups what we call an experience-like model. Some groups only got the engineering drawing, some got a concept drawing, some groups got a very nice foam model. And we wanted to see how that impacted their interactions, what they came up with, and uh, consequently their, um, their uh, outcomes. So these were the different secondary media. We selected cases because there was too much data. We had 1,047, we had 15 hours of video, 1,047 pages of transcripts. We had dozens and dozens of drawings. And so we reduced it to four for the sake of, of, of the research. At transcripts, we used V-code, which we coded the video and allowed us to do events and durations with different kinds. And this was grounded. So we were watching what was doing and identifying themes, whether the themes were gestural themes, whether the themes were verbal themes, whether the themes were ways they were doing drawing. We worked in transcripts and transferred them over. And of course, we put them all into spreadsheet and worked from there. It was very time consuming to do this. Several people looked at the at the data to make sure we were doing it right. Now, here are some of the big findings that we found. Um, teams started really working well together. They collectively entered an imaginary world, a semi-imaginary world, which in psychology, development psychology is called the paracosmos. So our code, was subjects physically act out the use of an object in an imaginary context. They grasp, they point, they use other media or their hands in an imaginary context. That is, you could unscrew it. Imagine you were walking down the street and you were picking berries. There were three levels of this we determined. There could be many more levels, but this is uh, you know, a simplification. And level one was they would make incremental changes to what they were redesigning if it was about buttons, adjusters, and usability. So we have the world, which is the fingers, and the object, right? So we have an object in a world. So you have buttons and adjusters, and they're talking about, well, you can move the button like this. You could do this with the button. Maybe it's a slider, but it's all these small hand motions, okay? And they made incremental changes, people who did that. The people who did gesture like this from the elbow to the fingers talked about changes in scenarios, use case scenarios, changes in functions, adding functions, and they did mid-level changes. And the people who started doing this started talking about networks. And you can see what they're doing is saying, I've got a network and here are the nodes in the network and this is how they all coordinated and worked together. And they did radical, that was associated with with changing the core of what the thing is, the very center of what the thing was. Okay. And an example of this is your mother's phone or your grandmother's telephone is not the same thing as an iPhone or a smartphone, which is a platform for digital exchange, right? Because it's in a different kind of network and its core is changed. So we looked at from wrist to fingers, we looked at elbow to fingers, and we looked at full arm movement. Again, this was all coded by, by basically. And here's an example of level one gesture. Or you notice that all the gesture is about this. And all they're doing is talking about changing and defining buttons. Okay. It's perfectly good, but we were looking for something else. So watch the gestures here. You could throw it, he's saying. You could throw it. Put it out of a room, you can throw it. We're in a scenario and we have functions, right? We're making major changes to the form of this thing. Now she's saying, oh, they all run around the room. Yeah. 
just in terms of the analysis was that enactment level one for optimizers, you could see we had 130 uh, instances of, of enactment level one, and they were optimizing, they were changing buttons. They did a beautiful job, it was incredibly creative. It was very limited to a small set of changes. But when these level two enactments happened, they started breaking the mold and started making a totally new thing. And then when you had level three here, these people totally broke the mold, put things into networks, uh, uh, horizontal and vertical networks, changed the very meaning of the thing. So that is, um, so again, what we found was the subjects making mental changes to the drawing were in level one, doing this, and speaking about it, by the way, also, right, because that's how we know, and looking at the drawings that all came together, and subjects making significant changes gestured like this or like this, right? And we know that from how they talked about it in the drawings, if they made network drawings, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's it for now. And I'll thank you again to this amazing group of people that I'm so fortunate to work with. Um, I uh, never expected this to go on this long. I don't mean my talk. Um, <laughs> I mean, I never expected that this data set would get used again and again, and a whole new generation of people, of really brilliant people, um, approaching it in a new way. Um, very, very happy about that. So thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Jonathan, uh, I'm sure. So this is the time to hear from you, um, from uh, behind your Zoom screens. Um, if you have questions for Jonathan about the data set, um, it would be really nice to hear questions from the audience. Um, yeah, and you could just, uh, I think, yeah, you can unmute yourself and, and just ask a question. Um, we have about five minutes for, for that. So we welcome questions at this stage. Yeah, Any questions from the audience here? Um, also, oh, well, come on, someone make one up. <laughs> I do have a comment, right? Can I stop? But it's also, maybe we haven't highlighted that enough, but that we, this data set is here, right? And there's still a lot of work that we can do with it. And also one hope is that once after we have this workshop that we might have teams that might wanna work on this data further, apply some of these techniques. And uh, so we're really also uh, searching for collaborations on this data set, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And that's why we want to make sure that the techniques that will be applied to the data set are kind of uniform across anyone who will be interested in that. Um, uh, in addition to what the participants already know. Um, so bringing that wealth uh, of experience to um, questions. So adding to what Viv said, oh, sorry, Julia, you have a question. Uh, Julie, Julia, Julia, welcome from Nottingham Trent University. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for this introduction. I'm sorry, I was running late. I had some uh, technical issue this morning. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really exciting. Um, I just have a question regarding because uh, so in your presentation, you talk about so um, more, I mean, generation of new ID, uh, new design, I mean, new um, um, concept. And I was just wondering if it's also you also take into consideration uh, the, um, I mean, the capacity of team to reach an agreement, because sometimes a team can spend a lot of time fighting in fact with each other. Uh, it's just, uh, I guess you, you probably already have checked that. Uh, I was just wondering if it's something that you plan to present or <laughs> Oh, well, well, if you can redact me to paper. Yes, I should. You can yeah, come, I have here. To come down here. Julia, that's a, a great question. Thank you. Or a great observation. Um, that's one of the core things. Um, what we found was I was looking at um, I was looking at how media created blocks or how it created
created uh, scaffolding. We call them anchors and scaffolds. And um, when teams would disagree and point to the media and say things like, oh no, that doesn't make sense because this thing is this, or the engineering drawing looks this way, or our list looks like this, that was disagreement. But there were teams that really were adept at building on each other. And it doesn't matter what was being um, uh, kind of offered to the group that they would uh, uh, build on it and take and say, oh, that's great. It could become this, or if you do that, then this would happen. And that actually became the core of our teach, which is uh, designing as performance. Um, that is teaching people the moves of how to make offers, how to break that down and how to build on them and transform them. In the same way that if you're a football team, um, you could, one person can say, here's my, here, you know, I have the ball, I'm gonna score, but that doesn't work really with professional teams. It happens once in a while. What does work is that they have plays so they know that if I send you the ball here, you'll send the ball to Ola, Ola will send the ball to James and James will put it in, right? And this type of agreement uh, is what a performative pattern is, right? Um, as opposed to, and, and this is a not so fine point, but I never use the word, or I rarely use the word idea because I don't know what an idea is and I studied math and philosophy. Um, and um, it's not clear that that's what they're doing. And the whole promotion of ideas, come up with lots of ideas. Well, first of all, how do you do that? Second of all, that's where problems start because it becomes my idea as opposed to your idea and someone's idea as opposed to everybody co-creating, radically distributing the creation of new experiences, right? And the whole thing about embodied work is that you're creating experiences. Situated work is you're not stuck on, here's my idea for a thing. It's I'm creating, that is we are creating um, uh, experiences, objects, behaviors, and narratives. So agreement happens because of people knowing how to offer and respond in a way that makes agreement, as opposed to being agreeable. Yeah, well, yeah, thank you. <laughs> another question? I know there's another somewhere. That's what's behind the name and vision. Um, really good question. And it was many years ago, and I don't remember the exact thinking, but I certainly wanted to have something that was, um, would capture people's imagination. And it was about envisioning. How do you envision, or in some ways it was about ex-visioning, that is, how do you put out in the world or how does the world get you to start imagining how a new world can be? Because that is the core of what all design is, whether it's uh, uh, sports, whether it's music, whether it is social sciences, it doesn't matter. It's envisioning how the world can be and you in order to create that new world. And that's what envisioning is. It's a loop. Why video? Why did you not use oh, great. other things? That's um, a great question. <laughs> um, Stand forward, yeah. like CDR, why not? Yeah. That's a great question, Baba. Um, so, I was working with some really wonderful people, Larry Leifer, Barbara Tversky, who is the gold standard of cognitive science and especially the kind of work we do. And I had a meeting with uh, Barbara and I said, well, I'm gonna do video. And she said, don't do video. You'll never get out of here. You'll be here for eight years. And I went and reported to Larry Leifer, who was my primary, that, well, I had this conversation with Barbara and she said, and he said, and Larry was the most like, explore, do what you want, go get lost and find yourself out. Then you'll become useful. Amazing, amazing. And he said, it was the only time one time he actually said, no. He said, no, we do video. That's what we do here. 
you'll do video. And I said, okay, I'll do video. I guess called my wife and said, honey, we're going to be here for, <laughs> for five more years. This is going to be a long one. Um, we at the Center for Design Research because we are not just interested in outcomes. We're interested in behaviors. Designing is a corpus of behaviors, right, and interactions. And the only way you can do that is through video. You could do it by watching, but the results from people just watching was not so good because it took sometimes 100 watchings of a video before our, the scales peeled off our eyes and we went, oh my God, they're doing this. It was right in front of us all the time. For example, just watching people do this and another person doing this. The whole notion of paracosmos, I think it was over 150 watchings of a, of a pre-study, a very small video, right? So video allows you to watch again and again. It gives you hard evidence that is multimodal evidence. So you can actually begin to see differently. And you could watch it with other people, which is the best thing in the world is watching these videos. And we, my group has done this, is watching videos and just talking it out. I see this, oh, I see this. Did you see that? Is that real? Oh, let's roll it back. Do they do that again? That's why video. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, John. So next on the agenda. The coffee break. Coffee break. A detailed coffee break. So it's the word detailed. It's good. Coffee, tea, yeah, um, water. Um, so from now till 11.15, please try and arrive uh, sharp on, on, at 11.15 um, so that we can kick off exactly. Um, and we'll also try to solve the microphone issue. Yeah. 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 You, you know, I think that um, the microphone on the computers might no, opisać tak w miarę zrozumiale i prześlę ci to, dobra? No spróbuję, dobrze, dobrze, jak będę rozumiał to. Żebyś tak mniej więcej zobaczył, czy to o to chodzi. No okej, fajnie. Dobrze. No to jesteśmy w kontakcie, dziękuję ci, może jeszcze tam się zgłoszę z jakimiś pytaniami, nie? Ale tak mniej więcej to ogarnia. O co tutaj chodzi? Dobra. 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 No to dzięki Dobra. Marek. Cześć, Cześć. Pa.
Unmute. Yes. Okay. Can everyone uh, hear me? Okay. Going okay. Yes, I think. Okay. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks for bearing with us while we try to work out these uh, kind of technical issues. Uh, this next bit that we're going to go into now, I'm first going to give a kind of general uh, introduction to multimodality communication and basically where me and Wim especially stand in terms of our research, uh, what we're doing. Uh, research relates to one another. So what, you know, how it kind of, uh, uh, how it differs, how it overlaps, etc. And then we're going to go into a bit of an introduction to motion tracking in general and get you started with that. So uh, first of all, yeah, so basically I want to start with this idea. If it can, uh, yes. So I want to start with this idea that one of the things I think is quite interesting and quite challenging about studying human communication is that it's incredibly complex. So if we look at this figure that I have here uh, on the left with production comprehension, this is from a uh, fairly recent paper from uh, Judith Holler and Steve Levinson that basically dives into uh, the complexity of human communication from this back and forth perspective. And thinking about the fact that it's not just uh, speech that you have or text or language per se, but it's really this continuous stream of kind of disjointed uh, signals. So you have, you have the speech signal, of course, but you also have head movements, you have facial expressions, you have manual gestures, uh, and, and you have all of these different things that basically need to be brought together into one cohesive message. So that's what you see down uh, slightly below on the comprehension side in this uh, segregation integration, where you need to take the different things and put it together into something that makes sense. And so I think this is quite interesting because this is something that's incredibly complex if we try to think about this from a data perspective, but it's something that we do basically every day when we talk to one another. We have this very quick back and forth where we use all these signals and we still understand each other quite well. So this is uh, uh, kind of what we, what we look at. We look at this uh, in the sense of the different signals that are happening uh, uh, kind of one, one after another on top of each other, et cetera. Uh, and thinking about the fact that there's also multiple scales of measurement that we can, that we can look at, whether this is uh, at the level of the, the body by itself or uh, the interaction overall, uh, what's happening in the brain, uh, et cetera. And so this is something that me and uh, Wim are both interested in in general. I've tried to make, make this kind of double scatter of uh, kind of interest points that we have. And what I think where we kind of overlap is this wanting to understand the complexity of human communication. How do we do this? How do we produce all these signals and why does it kind of work as one uh, thing? That's what you see here in the middle. Uh, and we're also quite interested in trying to basically make open and collaborative analysis pipelines. Basically, we have some ideas, of course, we find certain things interesting, but of course the different diverse perspectives also what we see here in terms of the, the hosts of this workshop, but also all of you who are participating, you all have different ideas and different perspectives I think it, one of the really cool things is if we can actually work together, uh, pool our expertise, and therefore are better able to actually understand what's going on. So it's also kind of the idea of this workshop is to uh, work together to create these open uh, collaborative pipelines so that if we can come up with some motion tracking solutions that may be novel to you, you can also use them for ideas that we would have no idea about. And also the other way around, if you have some analysis ideas that um, maybe we can't, couldn't think of or haven't worked out, you can also contribute to that and we can make this nice uh, collaborative community. So I also have in the, in the center, just to kind of point out and something that's going to come up as we progress through our different modules, uh, Python and R are both being used. We both kind of uh, have some expertise and interest in this. Uh, I lean a little bit more towards Python. Wim leans a little bit more towards R. So you're going to see this kind of mix because we just have our kind of our strong suits and our preferences a bit. Um, yeah, so on my side, uh, to kind of give you an idea of what I'm interested in as well, uh, I'm really interested in social interaction. You see this kind of uh, this conversational aspect. How do people uh, do this in a natural uh, setting in this kind of fast paced uh, interactive way? Uh, here at the bottom, I try to kind of illustrate this idea of taking the signals and seeing how we can basically get at people's internal uh, intentions uh, and how they change the way that they move or behave in different contexts or depending on what they're trying to do or intending to uh, give, as well as uh, looking at the brain level of this. So how does the brain basically organize in different functional networks in order to make sense of this, uh, this collection of, of signals? 
And when maybe you can uh, say something a bit more about uh, about your side, your expertise, and uh, what you're quite interested in. Yes, uh, thanks, James. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll keep it short. It's um, I think my research is about trying to have um, complex communicative processes and try to ground it in something more basic or something that maybe something that you get from the get go from just having a body, for example, or just uh, having certain movement properties that allow you to do certain things versus not others and try to explain more complex things and try to strip it down to see whether it's actually at least uh, in its most in its essence uh, derived from more basic processes. And that's either in gesture speech synchrony or that's, or for example, in a way that uh, uh, gestures become conventionalized and whether we can track that back to just body movements as is. Um, yeah, so we, we we have different perspectives, but we overlap indeed. And uh, I think all, all that is shared is that we try to make everything open science in a way that we also learn from each other uh, instead of uh, working against each other, <laughs> which could be an option, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could be an option, yeah. but uh, <laughs> luckily, luckily not. We like to collaborate, so that's good. Okay, so that's just kind of to give you an introduction of, uh, of who we are, where we stand, and uh, what we're doing here, and kind of you have an idea of, of who we are, basically, since we're going to be talking quite a bit uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, so I'm going to jump out of this one, uh, and we're going to move straight into uh, an introduction to uh, uh, motion tracking. So let me get this started. And basically, uh, what I want to do with this part of the, the presentation is now go a bit first kind of give a grand overview of what is motion tracking what are we talking about uh, how what are the kind of different options for this and how do they compare to one another and how should you actually pick you have so many different options nowadays i'm sure if you've looked into this before there are like a billion different options for how to perform motion tracking uh, and yeah you can completely lose your way trying to think of what the best way is so we're going to try to give you a kind of overview so you understand a bit how they compare to one another and maybe give you a bit of a start in uh, kind of finding your way around it. You're not sharing yet, so. I'm not sharing yet. No, you can share it then. Oh, hey, that's great to know. Okay, then I will stop share. Luckily, I was only on the title slide, so good, good. Let's see, then we want motion tracking. Okay. All good now, right? So you can see some motion tracking? Yeah, great. So what I want to start with here is uh, basically the kind of classic uh, gold standard for, for motion tracking, which is device-based, uh, usually optical tracking. And the way that this works is you place a, either sensors or reflective discs or something on the person. You can see it depicted here, basically different points on the hand uh, or on the shoulder or the elbow. And you use a series of cameras all around that will pick up the signal for uh, where these different joints are, essentially these reflective points or sensors in three-dimensional space. So this is a great measure because it's really, really accurate, uh, both on a spatial resolution, but also in terms of temporal resolution, you have quite a few samples per second, uh, and you can say it's quite reliable. Uh, of course, this does require a whole setup to use. Uh, you have to put it together, you have to put these things on people, uh, and then you have tons and tons of data, but it is a great way to do things. Uh, so we also have a somewhat more uh, recent device-based uh, innovation, which is uh, a markerless tracking. So here I'm showing the Kinect. I'm specifically showing the version 2 because there's a fair bit of research on that, uh, but there's also a newer version as well. And the, the, the idea behind this is that it uses infrared scatter to essentially get uh, a three-dimensional space or picture but without putting anything on the body. So you set it up kind of like a camera on a tripod and you still get a nice uh, 3D representation of a skeleton of a person. So it's quite nice, uh, but it's of course less accurate than having this perfect surrounding uh, optical tracking setup. And then what we're going to focus on now uh, for, especially for this workshop is the video-based tracking. So I'm gonna give some uh, introduction to that, essentially how it works uh, really briefly. I'm also not an expert on neural networks, so please don't worry about understanding the the great details. I'm sure someone in the audience knows more about it than me, but I want to give you an idea of what this is so it's not some black box, ma black box magic that you, uh, that you just kind of run. So the idea behind this basically is that if you have, say, an image, uh, which, you know, a video is then just a series of images, what this does is it's trained a neural network 
that picks up first different uh, features, for example, light dark contrasts and different orientations, which can then be built up into clusters of these uh, light dark contrasts to get features such as an eye, a mouth, an ear, and this can then be built up to detect, uh, for example, a face, a body, et cetera. And so this is just basically just a collection of detecting smaller things uh, by training a network over many, many iterations. And so what you get is, for example, if you have an image of several people standing, that you can detect contrasts enough to pick up a particular joint on the body. And if you have a joint uh, here and there, you can then, oh, you, I don't know why that it's not working, but essentially you can uh, then connect the dots and bring this together and say, okay, well, I know that this is this is a hand, this is an elbow, this is a shoulder. Uh, and then by looking at the pieces in between, you can essentially get, this is a person. And this is the really basic uh, gist of how this kind of motion tracking works is it just tries to pick up features that it has learned that this is a person or a hand or what have you. So one of the, the classic uh, ways to do this uh, that's also been widely used, I'm using as an example here, this is from Open Pose. Uh, and this is just to give you an idea that what you can get is similar to these uh, optical tracking or connect-based tracking. You just get several points across key areas on the body showing, for example, where the shoulders are, the, the top and bottom of the head, the knees, uh, and as well as various points on the hand. So this is quite nice because you can essentially get the same kind of uh, uh, features that you would normally be interested in, in getting. So there are quite a few uh, AI-based options like this that do uh, quite nice work. So these are some of the ones that we're going to be covering uh, at least a little bit in the workshop to give you some introduction or some kind of flavor of how they work. Uh, so we're going to be going over a bit of uh, open pose. This is one of the, the earlier ones that can be quite nice. Uh, Deep Lab Cut we'll hear about as well uh, and how that uh, differs from the rest. Media Pipe is a very uh, new one that could be running off of uh, Blaze Pose, not Media Pipe itself. Uh, and Frank Mocap, also uh, a very new, uh, pretty exciting option. I think we're also going to hear a bit more about uh, that and how that works. Uh, not listed on here is also uh, Open Face. I'll also give a little bit of an introduction to running that and doing some analysis on facial features. But most of the rest of this is really based on uh, the body and the hands, uh, because that's also what uh, a lot of these analyses that we're doing have been more focused on. So we have a little bit more experience uh, doing that. So this is just to give you uh, an idea of some of these uh, tracking systems and uh, how they compare, for example. So this is just a video of how Open Pose uh, performs. So you can see it looks quite nice. We have a nice two-dimensional video, of course, and it tracks uh, the finger joints as well as uh, well, the body and the face. And then we have Deep Lab Cuts. We also have my computer not liking lots of videos, I think. Deep Lab Cuts. Yes, here we go. So one thing to note on this uh, is that Deep Lab Cut is something that is you essentially train it to pick up particular features that you're interested in. So what you'll notice is that we have we have it tracking the hands of the individuals in the video, but we also have it tracking the, the pen. So for example, if you're interested in manipulation of objects or how people are interacting with things in the environment, this is a very nice flexible option. Again, we'll hear more about this, but uh, this is just to kind of give you a flavor of it. This is, oh, no. This is media pipe. Can't be too enthusiastic with the clicking. This is media pipe. Uh, here we have it working on some uh, top view uh, hand tracking. So it's not worried about the, the body per se, uh, but this is essentially trying to capture different points on the hands. And the nice thing about this is that it doesn't have to be able to see the whole body, which is something that open pose does really need. Uh, it just needs to pick up hands in the frame. Uh, and another nice thing about this, uh, as opposed to some of the other ones, is that it also tracks in 3D. So this is kind of a new thing because this is a two-dimensional video, of course. This is a series of 2D images. But the way that it works, because it's been uh, trained on essentially 3D models, uh, we'll also talk about that a little bit more when we go into it, it's able to infer the depth dimension. So even though it only sees the hands from the top view, it has an idea of, uh, of essentially where the, the depth points would be in this image. So this is quite an exciting new uh, implementation. Uh, another cool thing to mention about this one is that it is uh, very lightweight. So whereas Deep Lab Cut requires uh, a GPU and a lot of processing power, 
media pipe is quite light. You can just run it on your standard computer. It doesn't take an excessive amount of time. And it does provide, I think, pretty decent tracking for what it is. Finally, uh, Frank Mocap, uh, I think, is also quite exciting. This uh, kind of gives you an idea of this, again, three-dimensional tracking based on a 3D rendered model capturing uh, all the hands and the body. So you see there's some, some jitter in the, in the body, but it is capturing this hand shape quite nicely, which is really, uh, I think, uh, going really in the right direction for doing this kind of research. I'm not and sure which one is creepier. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair point. The, the model is interesting to see, yeah. <laughs> and we'll hear more about the, the jitter and how it's rendered and how it works from, uh, from Wim later on. So this is just a bit of uh, uh, pros and cons to give you kind of an idea because I because I just told you a bunch of uh, stuff about how it works. I've listed the Polymus here instead of uh, the Vicon, but you can kind of think of the same type of thing. Um, but essentially what I wanted to show is that some of the things you can use as comparison are the temporal resolution. Uh, so basically how many data points do you get per second, uh, the spatial resolution, how fine grains are gonna be, how flexible is it for tracking what you're interested in, uh, occlusion, because this can also be an issue, and whether it's 2D or 3D. So like I said, the top one I think is quite nice. If you, uh, it has a high temporal resolution, so you can get really, really fast uh, tracking quality uh, and really fine spatial resolution. Uh, tracking flexibility is also quite high because like I said, these sensors, I may mean, I show them in a standard formation, but you can also put them essentially on anything. Um, the flip side of that, of course, is that you have to put stuff on your participant uh, or participants and kind of set everything up like that. So it's a bit more set up. It's, close, uh, of course, also more pricey, but um, it does provide really good quality and it's in uh, 3D. So the Connect is kind of the next one. Uh, it has 30 hertz, but I think this is, it's a lot less, but it does capture kind of general human uh, movement, which is uh, very good. Uh, spatial resolution is also quite a lot less, uh, but this doesn't seem to be too much of a problem for at least kind of these larger uh, gestures and movements and things like that. Uh, happy to talk more about this in more detail, uh, but for now, I'm just trying to give a little bit of an, an overview. Uh, flexibility is fairly low. Uh, it tracks people. That's what it does. Um, or faces, but essentially another part of a person. It does track multiple people, so that's quite nice. But if you're interested in a pen or an object, it, it doesn't care, essentially. Um, and this is also 3D based on infrared scatter. So that's also uh, quite nice. The video based, um, yeah, it's quite variable depending on these different options. You're going to hear more about them, but this is just to give a, an idea. Uh, essentially the temporal resolution, it's gonna be the same as your video. So if you have a high quality video, same with the spatial resolution, by the way. If you have an old grainy video uh, at 25 Hertz, it's gonna be less spatial resolution. It's gonna be 25 Hertz. Uh, it's quite fine for most things, but just to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, and then just to go through some of these, uh, like I talked about before, open pose, uh, it doesn't have the, the flexibility of some of the others. Deep lab cut is really quite nice in terms of its, of its uh, flexibility. Uh, and then we see most of these are 2D uh, based, except for uh, uh, Media Pipe and Frank Mocap, which are now kind of pushing this next generation into more of the 3D inferred tracking by utilizing these three-dimensional models that are underlying what it's doing. Um, yeah, and then one other thing that's also a consideration, I know this has also been brought up in the challenges that uh, people sent in, is that if you have multiple streams of data, for example, you have an audio recording, you have a video recording, you have motion tracking recordings, all of these different streams of data have to be brought together and unified, which can be especially tricky if they're on different timescales, for example. So you really have to kind of resample and change things to, to get them. And in particular, if you don't have the same kind of computer clock or timestamp, then this can be more difficult. This is something we're going to talk a bit more about later on. So Vim's also going to tell you more about how to, how to deal with these different things, how to bring data together. Uh, but this is just something to consider. So the video based is nice in the sense that it utilizes some of the, the data that you already have essentially. So this is just to give an idea um, for picking your uh, motion tracking option of choice. I've made this kind of flow chart trying to consider what you want to track and what kind of data you already have. So for example, the finger hand shape or fine grain movements, the AI based tracking is going to be really great, especially if you already have the data available, it hasn't been uh, processed yet. Um, 
But then if you really need this fine grained information, you haven't collected it, then some kind of marker tracking or leap motion, which I didn't talk about here, because I'm not really going to go into it, but these kinds of things can also be used. So again, I'm not gonna go into this whole flow chart uh, in great detail. I just wanted to give you this as an idea. You can always come back to it, uh, but just to give kind of a sense of, depending on what you want to do, different options might be better for you. Also depending on the computing uh, power that you have essentially. Uh, yeah, so, oh, and one other thing just to mention uh, based on this kind of finger tracking is that while I do mention some of these as saying, well, then you need to go to the kind of fancier device-based tracking it can be that in the very near future, hopefully, that actually we have different solutions. For example, Frank Mocap that can provide this kind of nice finger-based tracking because rather than relying on, for example, what it can see in the image, it can infer it because it knows what the hand shape would be to create that image. So again, I'll go a little bit more into detail during the modules on how this might work and what this could do, but just to give kind of an idea and kind of the sense of uh, something that I'm very excited about, I know women's as well, that I think the future is really going into these more, uh, these kind of fancier tracking systems. I think we'll have fewer and fewer problems and more power for uh, what we use. So that's to give you kind of a, a jump start into what we're going to be talking about. So we're now going to go straight into the, the modules. Uh, I think for the first couple ones, uh, we're going to start with Wim, and he's going to show you how to get started with motion tracking. And then I'll jump back in uh, shortly to show you some more. Okay. Yes. Just a, 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 a observation. When I was training at the National Judo Institute, uh, I worked uh, with the Paralympians, and there was a blind guy who was magnificent, and he could put his hand on you and tell you where every other part of your body is, just by one hand. So when you were talking about this, like it infers, well, here's a shoulder, I can start there. That's basically, I'm wondering what the mechanism was for, for this guy, because he knew exactly, he just had to do this, and he knew where your feet were, he knew this and that. So this whole inference thing, I think, is something that, um, it, it's something we do all the time, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and it's exciting to see now we're getting tools that are going, well, we just need to know this much, and we're pretty good on the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's actually a really great point in general, because while the, these techniques indeed are now saying, oh, well, if we apply a 3D model, we know where stuff is, how novel, but indeed this is what people do with perception as well. Uh, for example, with, with how the setup is with these computers, I can't see Alibaba sitting there, but I know the rest of him is there and I can kind of guess the positioning of his legs. Well, well that's the funny thing about the Frank, the, the Frank, uh, Frank mocap, mocap, yeah, yeah. Is that it was bringing those legs up as if you were sitting down, right? But we yeah. know that, I mean, when I look at him, I'm inferring that he's standing up because of yeah. the way he's moving. Yeah, exactly. So I think there is some improvement there, room for improvement there, for sure. But this is, I think it's a good direction and kind of the natural direction indeed. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, we'll start with the modules. I also think that Gregor is making a really um, uh, important point that even if the, I'll go into the 3D uh, motion tracking, how sensitive it is, because it's still difficult to say, but these video motion trackings, uh, if you're a little bit more skilled, you can of course, uh, have um, multiple cameras and then start to synchronize uh, uh, in a way that you are much more sensitive and almost reaching a certain accuracy that you might expect from device-based uh, uh, pr uh, processing. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a reason why we're now at Firefox mm -hmm. because um, we also want to show you how lightweight media pipe is, is in terms of installation. For example, if we look at Frank Mocha, then it's actually quite a, it's a pain in the butt to install it. And it depends on your system and we're not really going into that, but at least for MediaPipe, we can show you that if, if you have a system where nothing is installed, it's quite easy to get it running. And that's something that we're that, that just doesn't only run on our systems, but also can run, be run on other things. So I'm gonna ask Ola, who will be doing uh, the installation for us. Um, can you install Anaconda? Uh, on a, it's a Windows based machine and she will uh, install Anaconda with all the default settings. Um, so we go to Anaconda, we're gonna Google Anaconda install and we're gonna install it. I'm installing on Windows? Yeah. And we just download. And start downloading. So now we're gonna just let that on the background. We'll hear from Ola when it's done, when the, when the installation is done and then we're, we're gonna go on and show you uh, that MediaPipe uh, can be easily run. 
Um, that's now for me. Uh, I'm going to go uh, show you the media pipe module, specifically single body tracking. Um, and um, Kiana, for example, asked, well, this 3D tracking, how sensitive is this? Uh, I first want to comment on that because, for example, on the media pipe website, and I'll show you that uh, as well, they say, well, the depth dimension is not as accurate as the X and uh, Y dimension. If you're, if you, if the vertical or if the depth dimension becomes C, uh, depends on your, uh, I don't know, whatever. Uh, the depth dimension is not as sensitive to the horizontal and uh, vertical one. Um, that's what they have been saying so far. But it's also because media pipe is not is also quite lightweight. So it's also uh, the Frank mocap, which is based on GPO video card uh, tracking, is uh, much more accurate and is actually designed to do the 3D tracking. Having said that, we don't really know yet how well it compares, for example, in the in the kind of settings that we're usually interested in. Of course, they are benchmarked. For example, MediaPipe is more sensitive uh, than OpenPost, uh, and it's 53 times faster. Uh, and Frank Mokov has also been shown to be super, the most superior 3D motion tracking right now. However, um, how does it how does it show for us in our tests that we might be interested in? That's something we don't know yet, and I think we need we need more benchmarking from the people who are using and using them for their research as well. And that's something that it's not well, or I don't know I do not know a lot of benchmarks on Frank Mocap on all the new next generation 3D invert uh, invert uh, motion tracking. But I'm going to go to the module now. Um, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you. Uh, this part where we have our uh, modules. I'm also going to start. Um, I'm just going to open it in, on the phone up. So, uh, or in Jupyter Notebook. And, oh, you're already done. Okay. Uh, this is great. So, so, yeah, somebody has, a, we have an echo. So, one second. Is it me? Yeah, okay, we, we we have an echo, so one second. <laughs> it's already muted. It is, it is, it is muted. Okay. Okay, now, okay, now we're good. Okay, so uh, Ola is already done with the Anaconda install. So let's go back to Ola. Um, Can you see my screen? Not yet, because I'm... Sharing now. Yeah, I'm not, I'm also sharing, right? So I'll stop sharing and... Is it opening the installation? Yeah, okay, we see your screen now. Okay, yeah, you, you can just go on and click everything uh, through. We don't have to uh, see you install it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, we're okay. just gonna install everything. Everything is default and then, uh, so you can stop sh uh, screen sharing yeah. and I'll- uh, Recording in progress. So we're going to uh, do our Python module where we have MediaPipe body tracking. And uh, I'm gonna start it. Uh, uh, here, we're going to go to uh, media by body tracking. Here is where our uh, actual notebook lives. And um, I can hear, oh, this is my TV editor. You can open it here. And then later on, I'll show you how Ola will actually execute the code. So one thing is that for, uh, there is a lot of information on MediaPipe and they're also continuously changing. So there's a really, some really cool features. We have single body tracking. It's only for one person uh, now. Um, it runs on your CPU. So you don't need special installations like CUDA or uh, CUDNN or all that kind of, uh, all these kind of dependencies as you will see, uh, just require, it just runs on your CPU and it's quite fast. Uh, we have made a script where you just, uh, you, you drop a bunch of, uh, uh, media uh, in your um, uh, in your folder, and it will just track them, and it will produce time series. For example, we have a media to analyze here, and we have this video uh, here. And if you have multiple videos, it will just loop through those videos and it will track them. And we have, for example, the time series output. That's what the script will produce. And here you will have uh, output of uh, a time series that you can work with, right? Uh, that you don't see right now, but uh, you can click on that and you can explore that. Um, so let's open this and uh, let's go to uh, the actual mo the module here. Let me share my screen correctly. Uh, 
Two seconds. Okay, so here's the module. Um, and um, uh, so MediaPipe is doing a lot of uh, developments. It's actually from Google, right? Uh, and they're doing a lot of development. So one thing that they've also been doing is trying to infer not only the pixel position or a normalized position of the body, but also infer back to a metric system so that you can say, well, my hand was moving so many meters per second. It's also an inferred approximation of it, but it's really nice for if you have different camera settings, if you have different kind of ways, it's nice to go back to an, a dimensional uh, number. Normally, you, you, you or to a dimensionless number that you can actually have a video, even if there are slight changes, you can still infer uh, back to meters. Um, but uh, we're not using that right now, but we're, please check out the media pipe um, uh, actual information. Uh, it's on the Google GitHub. And there you will find that uh, the new functions that you can tweak our script with, right? You just have to replace some functions if you want to get something else. Okay, so um, what we have is, um, I'll just go through the code real quick. Uh, first, we are loading in some uh, packages that we need. We're also initializing here uh, some information uh, or some functions that we need from Media Pipe, Pipe itself. And it's in a drawing module, so you can have uh, your key points drawn onto a video. Because often, what we want to have, it's not only a time series, we also want to see how well a, a particular motion tracking is doing when it's overlaid on. Um, when it's overlaid on your actual video, right? And uh, here, what we do is uh, we load in or we initialize the folders where we where our videos live, for example. We list all the files that are in there. For example, if you have 100 videos, it will loop through those videos because we have made a list of those videos. And we uh, say something about where to store the time series in the videos. Okay, then we have an... Uh, an function, these media media pipe uses its, its own kind of format and we wanna have a format that we can actually use by uh, extracting only the relevant information, um, namely only the numbers and that's something that we have here. Then we have all the key points that media pipe uses in that kind of uh, uh, order. And uh, here is another function. Yeah, I can, I can go slower, yeah, yeah. So here is a, here are all the markers that we, we want to make an object where we want to know if we're going to write in time series object, we have a rows, each information about the frames uh, and for each key point. But we also want to know uh, what each uh, output we get from media pipe. It doesn't come with column names or anything. We just get a bunch of values, but these values are structured and they're structured in a way in this order. For example, the first number that you get is a nose a key point or the next one is a left inner eye uh, key point. And these are all the key points that MediaPipe uses. Uh, and these are here. Um, and then we have another function that just extracts from any kind of object, uh, just the numbers instead of strings. This is an e, it's just a quick function that we use. And uh, what we also do is having another uh, uh, kind of a function that takes an uh, uh, object from media pipe and it uh, makes it in a format that we can actually use. Um, and notice that I will not go through every little bit of this code. It's actually, we invite you to tinker with it, to see what's happening and to actually go into the code yourself. But since we have so many modules, it's not something we uh, go do for everything. It depends a little bit on uh, uh, what kind of uh, granularity we want you to uh, have, for example. Um, so here we have, the actual procedure, we have a list of files, right? Only our files that are our media to analyze. And we're going to loop through them uh, and we're gonna select one of them and call them FF. And for this FF, we're going to read that particular video and we're gonna extract some, uh, some information uh, for it. We're gonna ask, well, this video that we have in this uh, iteration of the loop, uh, what kind of frame width does it have? What frame height does it have? What is the frames per second? So the sampling rate of that particular video. And remember that if you have a higher sampling rate, you will also have a higher temporal resolution, right? So if you are sampling at 50 frames per second, your video motion tracking becomes also higher in temporal resolution because you're, you're loading in a frame, 
and then you're doing the pose estimation, and you'll just have more pose estimations within a second, maybe 50, right? So that's something to go to think about. Um, then we also, that's our sample array that we have right here. And um, we also write a video. Uh, we initialize the writing of a video, namely the motion tracking video. We have a video, a, a raw video, but we also wanna have an overlaying video. And that's what we do here, we have a video out. Um, then what we have here is we have these key points, but actually what MediaPipe will give, it will not give only the key points, but it will also give the X, Y, and Z coordinates, right? So for every uh, key point, you will have three values plus another one, um, which is the visibility of the particular um, uh, joint. So is it visible or not? And we're making a list from this that we say, well, we have our column names, but actually we're a little bit more columns because it's nose X, nose Y, nose Z, and then the visibility. So we're making a list that we will later use to make our time series uh, object. And we write a column names to our time series object so that you can just inspect it in uh, whatever, wherever you're inspecting it in, but you also know which row, uh, which column belongs to which key, key, key point of the body. So um, this is the actual part where we say we want to use media by uh, function. These are the settings. We have a particular settings of what the minimum confidence should be before media pipe should actually track it. And these things you should play with. You should play with your video and see how it matters. And also look in the document, uh, document uh, documentation uh, um, in, the, in the beginning of the documents. Uh, the model complexity says something about how heavy do you, does your model have to be trained? So if you have a, a model complexity of zero, it will be faster, but it will also be less accurate because it is a model that is less uh, trained on data. Um, so um, it's a speed accuracy trade-off there. We're now using the heaviest model. Uh, you also have the, min track, uh, the minimum tracking confidence is that if you go from one point to the next and you lose it, do you, want, uh, do you want to have a certain confidence that you've lost it or not? And that is uh, the min tracking confidence that you can also play with to uh, optimize your tracking. And we have the smoothing of, of uh, landmarks. You could, either, you could have a situation where you only have pictures and you only want to have body shapes. But we are analyzing a video and we know that if your hand is here, the next frame, it will likely be there quite close to it. They're out of correlated as it were. So um, the, from frame to frame, this, the position tends to correlate. It tends to, tends to be at the same position. So what MediaPipe takes, takes this in and says, well, we're gonna process, process this as a video instead of independent frames or pictures. Um, so, okay. So here we, uh, we ask if, um, we have a frame detected from our video. Capture reads, uh, and our capture is the main uh, video that we've initialized. Then we're gonna ask if there is in the frame, then we are going to uh, process the pose. And this is the actual media pipe function that we use. Um, and we're going to process this frame and we want to have the results. And the results will have information about the, key, the body points. And if you're using this code yourself, just print it to the console and see how it looks, for example. Um, and here, uh, if there is nothing detected or is the, if there is something detected, then we will write this into uh, some data. So here we're extracting the new sample marks. So all the, the positions of the XYZ, um, uh, the XYZ uh, positions of the joints. And we're doing some data wrangling, just making it into a format that we can actually work with because MediaPipe uses a slightly different format. And we're using these functions that I've explained abo above. And then what we also do here is we have a drawing module. Or let me say, say we have a time series object here. Let me first go there. I have a time series object and that's actually the object that we're gonna fill, right? And I've initialized it somewhere. I've here have a, a time series object and we've initialized it. The first row is our add variable and our add variable were all the nose X, nose Y, nose Z, all these uh, column names is the first row. So that's how we initialize our time series with. And then here we extract the information from uh, MediaPipe and here we append the time series with a new frame data, with new 
from this frame, we have new uh, position data, X, Y, Z, and we're gonna add it to this time series object, and we're gonna fill the time series object, append, append, append for every frame, right? And we're filling this time series object, so to write it later, and we have all the information. Um, then another thing, we are doing using the drawing module, where we say we wanna draw something on the frame, uh, and we wanna draw um, the key points that we've detected by uh, media pipe, and we're using this function for it. And then we're going to show uh, the image that, we're, uh, that we wrote this on, namely the frame. We've called it the frame. We're going to show this image. Uh, and as, as you will see with Ola, once she run, runs it, that it will appear in your console to see that how fast it's tracking and that it's actually tracking. And um, then we uh, write it out the frame because we're also saving it as a video later on. And uh, we also have a time variable. Well, a time, we know for every frame, that depending on your uh, frames per seconds of your or your sampling rate of the video, what the time should be, right? Every frame should accumulate a certain amount of time, namely depending on your frames per second. So here what we do, so we have it here, we uh, divide a thousand milliseconds by the sample rates uh, and that is added to the time. And we'll add that time vector next to the, in our time series object so that we know, well, this position of the hand uh, was uh, occurring at 600 milliseconds for as an example. So we have that information too. And it's really in, important for data wrangling because maybe at some point we wanna merge it with the timestamps of your acoustics. We'll go uh, into that later. Um, so then we, um, if, if there is nothing, if we uh, press escape, we can uh, just enter out of this whole process here it says, if we don't have any frames detected anymore in our video, we just quit. So we break the whole cycle. And these are just some de-initializations. We don't need a console or we don't need a, 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 the video shown anymore. And uh, we destroy all our windows. And then here, this is the magic moment where we have our time series object, right? And we open a file where we want to write a CSV with. We're gonna take the name of the video, and that's what our time series will be called. So uh, that's why we uh, remove the extension. So the point uh, or dot mp4 and add a dot csv. That's our initialization of the csv file. So comma delimited uh, file, and then we write our file and we write our time series information to it. And then we have saved. We have a time series. So um, important things just to reiterate. Media pipe has a lot of information uh, for other things that, that you could do. You could extract meters per second. Now we're extracting uh, a normalized uh, um, uh, key points. And um, you could also have different kind of uh, key points uh, that you want to select in this code, depending on what you want, right? Um, and this is uh, an example of what, what, how, the, how the actual data structure looks like. We have a time variable that increases with uh, uh, 33 milliseconds uh, because there was a frame rate of 29.97 frames per second and that, that equals about 33 milliseconds. So, um, Ola, how far are we with the installation? It's done. Okay, okay, great. So let's go to Ola. I'm gonna unshare my screen and let's see if, if this runs on Ola's machine. So should I unmute myself? Or do yeah, yeah, let's do it. So I hope oh, you all can muting. hear me. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So uh, I've installed Anaconda and then I search for Anaconda prompt. I open it. And what I have to do first is install pip. It's like an installer. So I point, I type in conda install pip. And one second. So you've now installed Anaconda. Everything is set. It means that your Python is installed. Everything in your system knows when Python is called where it lives. And uh, we, this, is an, this is the next operation. So we have an Anaconda prompt where we can enter in uh, calls, for example, to open Jupyter Notebook. And, uh, but now we're actually first installing some things. And the first thing is PIP, which is an installation package, package itself. itself. So, so it allows you to install stuff. stuff. Yes, because I tried it before, it, it re re returns that all requested packages already installed, but it's yeah. probably it's gonna be installed yeah. and uh, different for you. And then when I have pip, I can go pip install media pipe, right? Pip. Yeah. And uh, now it's just retrieving media pipe because it's very smart. Pip is super smart. It's just 
knows what to do. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and now it, it has installed everything. So what I can do is I can uh, just go to my directory where the bootcamp files are, and I can just. So it is here. If you downloaded the GitHub repository, you can just copy the uh, the directory and point uh, and type in cd change directory and now you see i'm here in this directory and i can open jupyter notebook there and something should come up wow it does and i go to python so now we're working on media pipe but maybe some uh, so sorry that was maybe too fast uh, python and body tracking media pipe and i open this uh, ipynb um, which is notebook file. So that's actually notebook that we had, right? So yes. That I just showed you. Exactly. And now we're going to run everything. Yes. <laughs> this is working with Vim is pretty nice <laughs> with Vim and James because I just can run things, you know? So it always takes a little time. So I run the first one, now the second one, the third one. And so now the, the did actual. Did you run the thing. first one too? Maybe I'm just slow. I did. See. I did. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And see the output here. Okay. It's not. Uh, maximizing very well, but you can see the output here, just exactly what Vim showed you. You're just, just running this on a like a generic uh, laptop. Just right? a very like a straightforward. So there are no tricks, right? Yeah, no tricks. Normal yeah. laptop. Yeah. yeah. So it it runs. It was quite easy, Vim. Thank yeah. you for showing it to me. So it's really install Anaconda. Go to Anaconda prompt. Conda install pip. Then uh, uh, go to your folder and enter it there, and just open Jupyter notebook. Uh, oh, and I forget, of course, pip install media pipe, and you should be uh, good to go, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to the next module, and uh, James is going to take over. You're doing the, the hand one, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, but I think the hand one, so we, we do have a hand. Uh, 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 yeah, I can go through it quickly. Um, let me first go to the... One second. So media pipe also has the hand tracking, right? So we actually showed that already. And actually it's, the code is almost replicated. The hand tracking uh, is specifically focused on the hands as you would expect. And um, what is nice about the, the hand tracking is that you get a lot of resolution in terms of the hand shapes that you don't get for the body tracking. So if you're, if you're interested in the complexities of the digits that have a certain posture, then this media pipe is really uh, interesting to use because it has such a high resolution. And it's also, again, quite fast to use. So I'm just going to open up my uh, uh, multi-hand uh, tracking. And... Um, no, 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 no. So I'm just going to open on the front and I'm going to navigate to that. And you don't see my screen right now, but I just believe in what I'm doing. So I'm going to open Jupyter Notebook. And it's a, it's a difficult to share uh, the screen if you go opening different kind of, um, uh, opening different kind of uh, um, uh, windows. So I'm going to wait for uh, my uh, Jupyter Notebook to start. And um, so when it's starting, I'm, I'm first going to show you the quick, the, um, again, the uh, folder structure. So now we have media to analyze, and we have three videos in here. So we have, for example, this one, if you can see it, if you open it now. Well, you cannot see it because the screen sharing is to one. So here we have a, a second person view, just the front view, and media pipe hand tracking does do that too. We have a top view, which you've already seen. So if you're on a first person view or just have a lot of hands, just uh, from the top view, it also handles that. And we have a first person uh, for a single person view. So it can handle multiple persons and it can handle um, uh, different perspectives. So that's also really nice about this body tracking uh, or uh, the tracking of the hands. So now I'm gonna uh, go and share my uh, Jupyter Notebook. So now I've started Jupyter Notebook, right? And here it is. Here it is. Gonna make it full screen. And I'm gonna open the, the Media Pipe Top Hand module. And remember, the kind of installation that Ola did was already um, is already um, the kind of installation that Ola did is can also work for this one. So you don't need to do anything differently. And again, what uh, MediaPipe does here 
is um, actually the, the same code. We just use a different kind of uh, module to do the tracking of the hands. So I'm not going to go into this because we, we don't have a lot of time. Um, we're just running this and it will also go through all these files. And uh, one important feature is that we again have different kind of information here about uh, what we want to track and not. For example, how many hands do you want to track? That's something you can set. Um, there are some uh, other things that we need to consider that if you're doing multiple body track, uh, hand tracking, uh, it can be difficult to align and see which hand belongs to next, the next frame uh, or the next hand in the next frame. And we've also um, written a script on that, but I think we shouldn't go too deeply into this. Um, uh, so you can just run this similar as Ola did just yet. And uh, maybe I can show you uh, how it's performing if I share my uh, other window that is actually now running. Um, and then James can set up for the next module. So now we're running this media pipe. It's a 3D hand tracking. Again, the depth dimension is not as sensitive to the other ones. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what kind of perspective, perspective we have. So um, let's go on to the next modules. Do you want me to open uh, the modules? Or? I can do the modules. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's all okay. good. All right. So thanks, Wim, for the introduction and the, to these first bits of, of motion tracking. So I'll need to go a little bit into uh, kind of what Wim was just mentioning, this linking aspect. So I'll go ahead and switch my screen sharing to that now. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so you now should be able to see my uh, Jupyter Notebook already open, great. So yeah, I'm not going to talk too much about this, uh, this script because you don't necessarily need to, uh, to know all the details per se to, to kind of get what it's doing. Uh, definitely happy if you want to, to play with it, tweak it, um, and improve it even. This is just something I kind of came up with to solve this issue of you have several hands in a frame, but you don't necessarily know which one belongs to whom. And as you go from frame to frame, uh, you can't really link them together. A media pipe doesn't necessarily provide you with that. You just kind of have individual frames, right? So the general idea about this is, uh, as we mentioned, is to think about uh, if you go from one frame to the next, uh, a hand that is the same hand from one frame to the next should be quite close uh, to where it was in the previous frame. So that's essentially where we start out here is where I have this function that tries to find the, the closest hand from these between these different frames. So I'll take the collection and just say, uh, linking through them or uh, looping through them, sorry, you have this one from the current frame. Now let's look the previous frame, all of these different uh, hands that we found which one is closest to this one. And it will just try to draw these, these kind of links and create IDs for that. We have a couple of other uh, functions here as well, just to kind of briefly mention them because they'll be used throughout the script. Uh, I try to get the, the slope and the intercept. Uh, and the reason for this is because we also will want to say, if you have, for example, three people interacting with one another uh, and you have three left hands and three right hands, which ones are paired with which one? And then we have IDs for each of them that we also have. We can also say, okay, this is left hand with this right hand. This is this left hand with that right hand. And all of this is used basically to position the hands that we've tracked on the screen and try to infer uh, what belongs where. And if you have a kind of static configuration, this at least works. This becomes more difficult with more dynamic ones. Uh, but at least for this example, this is something that you can use. So again, I'm not going to go too much into detail about this. I'm happy for you to uh, send me an email later or chat. Uh, totally fine, happy to hear your thoughts on it. But essentially what we're gonna do is loop through the, the file, uh, like we mentioned, uh, go through and first try to find uh, any uh, uh, duplicates that are being made. So basically some of this tracking you probably saw before is that there's one hand, but MediaPipe tracks it twice just because of uh, some sort of tracking error. And so we'll first strip those out and make sure that we're not uh, being messed up by that. Then we're going to go through and get the closest uh, ID'd hand. Are those contiguous frames? Meaning are they right next to each other or is it just anything that looks the same? Uh, so this is essentially in one frame. Okay. It's one hand and there's, it's like a double track. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So this is definitely something that's an error. So yeah. it's not frame to frame, it's one frame. One frame, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, and then we're going to get the, the hand orientation in here. So again, this is going to be to try to do the pairing, which I'll show next. Uh, the directions, uh, so this is essentially trying to get, uh, is this coming from the, the left of the screen, the right of the screen, the bottom, the top? Again, just to kind of get the overall global configuration. Uh, yeah, so we'll kind of just kind of go through here. If you run this, it will also give you this output. So it will tell you essentially that it's working. It will save this as a new uh, file. And so you've seen what the data frame looks like. What you're going to get from this is the same, except it's going to provide you with some uh, hand IDs. For the first frames, it doesn't find things that are linking up, but that's fine. It will do that later, uh, as well as the, the orientations. And then we, uh, the next thing we're going to do to process this is to remove any hands who only tracked a fraction of the time. Because again, this can be something that might not be an actual hand. It might be something that it IDs, but it doesn't actually link up to anything. So we just remove that as well. Um, and then for the pairing function, uh, this is where we take all of that information. And just to give you kind of a gross overview of this, what we try to do is essentially say, as an example, uh, if you have from the bottom of the frame, we know that there's a left hand, it's oriented in such a way that it points down to the bottom of the screen. And then so we say, okay, well, we look to the right of that sliding along, is there a right hand that also points to the bottom of the screen? What's the closest one that does that? And that's going to be the one that says, I think this is a pair. And it will just sort of rotate around uh, counterclockwise, essentially from left to right to try to find the closest pair. It's kind of just an overly intuitive way of doing it. Uh, and of course, if you reach across one another, do anything like this, we're going to have errors uh, because then it's going to say, oh, well, now it's actually paired with that one. Uh, this is just a lot of these kind of blocks uh, where it's doing this for all these different possible configurations, by the way, uh, whether it's on the bottom, right, top, left. So uh, to get around this, uh, this issue of crossing hands, we have another block that's going to try to basically what I call in here, stabilize the, the tracking. So we say, okay, 90% of the time, this left hand one is paired with right hand two, but then every now and then it switches over. So the other 10% of the time it pairs with a different hand. So then we say, no, no, no. If it's 90% of the time with this one, it's this pair and it's going to lock that in. So see again, uh, so this is after the stabilization and now we have this information in our file as well. And then another block, uh, I won't go through this too much. This is essentially the same as what we do with the tracking. We're just going to try to take the points that I've now uh, calculated and put this back onto the video. So not just the tracked points, but also the IDs. So this part I do want to show because this is, I think, is the, is the kind of key aspect of this. Uh, so I'm going to open this up real quick and then I'll share that, which I believe should be possible. Let's see. So I think I can just share my screen generally. Screen, yes. Okay. And what we'll get is in this folder, uh, we'll have a video, which uh, is called the same as your file name, but then paired. So I'll open this up and you'll see it'll give the same kind of tracking points, but now with this extra information that the, the file has added onto it. So let's let it play through once. So the, the point, I think the, the thing to show, see if there's something where it's not overly overlapping, um, is that we have the, these IDs. They, now they're actually stable across the different hands. You'll see that, for example, uh, ID five is paired with nine. This nine, the right hand is paired with five, et cetera, et cetera. And left hand is not paired with anything uh, because essentially it didn't have a best track or it didn't have uh, one that was better than one of the others. So this is just to show that this is kind of a, a simple way of doing this, but it is a way to get IDs that you can then use and get a kind of stable continuous time series out of it. You say this is especially important for the multiple. Yeah, exactly. This is especially important for when you're tracking multiple hands because then you, you otherwise don't really know what's happening. If you're tracking one person, it's not necessary, right? Because then you just have a left hand and a right hand uh, time series. But when you start looking at multiple people and you can't separate them out, then you need to do this kind of post-processing. James, does it also work in another view, not in the top view? Uh, yeah, this in principle should work uh, anytime the hands are visible. So this, we use this as an example of showing multiple hands, uh, but you don't have to have the top view indeed. Yeah. Okay, then I will continue uh, 
sharing like this. So I think uh, for now, I'm just going to, uh, so I have an open pose module. I won't go into this too much right now. It's simply because we don't have time, uh, but you can find this on the website and go through it yourself. Um, we're going to mainly focus on media pipe today anyway, but I put this together just to give you an idea of how it works. Uh, to give you some kind of example scripts uh, for actually running uh, open pose. It provides the, the advantage that it tracks multiple people and multiple hands. And I also provide some code for actually extracting this into, for example, Python into uh, time series data, writing that to a file, uh, and do a little bit of comparison with MediaPipe. And just to give you a quick little spoiler, it does perform quite well. So they both do quite well. But for now, uh, I'll first go into open face just to give you a little uh, flipping things up a bit, a bit uh, and going into something a bit different. So this first part, uh, also for now, I think isn't too important to go into too much detail. This is something for you to kind of do uh, at home if you want to try this yourself. But I did kind of do put together a bit of a tutorial or a step-by-step -step instruction on uh, installing it, uh, how to do this. Uh, it's quite simple actually to run uh, also offline, uh, but also via command line. And uh, yeah, what you what you end up getting with this, uh, I think, is the, the kind of main point. Because, like I said, you can run this on your data at home. I think that's a bit easier for now. Uh, but to give you an idea of what you're going to get if you run OpenFace, is uh, you get first of all a series a CSV file with a whole bunch of different things that are being tracked. Uh, and the first set of these are action units. And for those who aren't familiar with uh, research on the face and facial signaling. These action units are things like the inner brow razor, uh, outer brow razor, lid tightener, nose wrinkle. So these kind of different things uh, are basically muscle groups that your face uh, can do. And you have a nice little example uh, uh, here of these different things. And uh, so this is kind of a way to basically break apart the face into these different things that you can be doing based on the different muscles. Uh, and what you end up getting is a series of columns that are the action unit, then the number, and then either a C or an R. And the, the C values are essentially saying, is this action unit present? So this is like a timestamp that you're going to get and say, okay, from this time to that time, the, the right outer brow is raised, for example. Uh, and then in the, the AUR column, you're going to get something similar, but this is going to be the intensity. So this is something that uh, if you do action unit research, typically this is also broken into uh, like five uh, values off the top of my head that basically tell you how intense is this? Is it really raised or is it just a little bit? Uh, same with the mouth, uh, you know, the mouth gestures or the, the eyes or anything. How uh, salient or big is this gesture being made? Um, something to keep in mind here is that these model, there are these, these different values are modeled off of, well, two different models essentially. So they don't always correspond. So uh, it could be that you get uh, no presence of an action unit, but a non-zero intensity. A bit unintuitive, but this is basically how this is, uh, is set up. So it's just something to keep in mind that you might want to look at both or really think about how you're going to use this. Uh, in fact, uh, I would actually say, depending on how you're going to do this, I wouldn't necessarily trust the action unit detection out of the box. It's a very cool feature. Uh, I'll come back to it uh, a little bit later on in this, but essentially it's not as accurate as you might want if you want a really continuous stream of exactly when things are happening. If you just want a general detection, it might work okay, but at the very minimum, I would definitely advise you to check your data very carefully after you've done this. Uh, the next set of values that you get are facial landmark coordinates. Uh, so this, you can see, is a face with eyebrows and eyes. Ooh. Somewhere there's a face. Yes, and a nose and mouth, and you essentially get the coordinates for each of these different points on the face. So this is something I think is a little bit more reliable for this kind of tracking that you really, you can kind of see continuously what these different points are doing. Uh, and we also get head pose. I think this is also quite nice. So you get, for example, the, the pitch and the roll and the yaw of the head, uh, which also gives you an idea of essentially what the person is doing in the frame as well as eye gaze positioning. So gives you basically a lot of data essentially on what the, the head and the face in general is doing. And this continuous tracking, I think, is quite nice. So I have some, uh, some code here as well to go through uh, importing open face also into uh, Elan. Uh, this is quite nice because even though this is in a CSV file, the package, uh, this explo face, 
it, it basically just gives you some kind of intuitive quick functions. So for example, importing it, uh, it gives you these values. You can already see the X, Y, and Z values, the, uh, the action units, et cetera. But you can also do things uh, like get some, some stats out of this. So from this example file, we can essentially see, uh, for example, the average length of the detections, uh, the number of detections, how many times were these different action units actually activated in the video that you have. Uh, another very handy thing is that you can use this, uh, this exploface write elan file in order to create a file that's ready to be imported into elan that gives you just these, uh, these different timestamps essentially, but then in annotation format. So quite easy to go in there, put it in there with, uh, with your video and uh, check how things have uh, performed. So there's some potential applications. I'm going to go into this a bit in, I think tomorrow on the, I have an open face analysis uh, module as well. And then we'll spend a bit more time looking at how to actually use this data uh, for some analysis and uh, to kind of get you started with that. Um, yeah, like I said, just a quick note on the reliability for this. Um, so we did a study, uh, well, essentially my PhD stud student did this study where we looked at uh, uh, facial action, action units and facial signaling looking at manual coding, but also the detections. And at least for that, when you want to have in natural conversation, good timing of when these things start and end, when these signals are happening, uh, it wasn't reliable enough to use just for that. And I see this being used quite a bit for research where people just use it out of the box and don't check it. So that's why I add this note on reliability. Uh, and you can check the paper if you wanna know exactly what we were interested in to see if it kind of aligns. But essentially this is something I think that should be checked before you, uh, just throw it into an analysis pipeline, essentially. Uh, yeah, so then we're almost out of time. I think we'll maybe go a couple minutes over. That way we have time to actually uh, show you this stuff, but then Wim will go into uh, the Frank mocap to also give you some more idea of how to do this type of nice, uh, more 3D based motion tracking. Sorry, this was a bit quick. Hopefully you have an idea of how this works. Uh, I'm happy to, to answer questions or chat with people in the breaks or via email or anything. So we do have one question. Ah. Uh, so do the videos need to have a certain quality in all these um, uh, different video tracking? Or can, because someone's using it for secondary data, how, how, what, what do you mean? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's uh, it's yeah, not it's something. Question, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I guess the question is whether you have a certain, certain requirement for video quality in order to do these types of uh, uh, tracking or analyses or anything? And the answer is essentially yes. Um, but the problem is that we don't know exactly what that would be. But this is kind of what I tried to allude to earlier on when I was just giving the introduction is the quality of your video is also going to determine the quality of your tracking. So these algorithms work quite well, but if you have older grainier videos, it's just going to be a lot harder to track what the person's doing. Um, that, our experience with it was that, um, our experience with that was, as you know, um, we had, in order to use the V code, the files had to be quite small. And then we had to go back to our original uncompressed files and ship them from Stanford, et cetera, et cetera, because they weren't, they were fine for what we did by I, but they weren't fine for what the computer needed. So we needed bigger files. How big? As you said, not sure, but as long as we were doing that, we, you know, we had the biggest files possible, which were pretty big. Right? Yeah. 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 Thanks for that. That's a, it's definitely a good kind of case example of how this works. And also just to add to that as well, it's hard to say if a certain resolution, for example, is, uh, is sufficient. Uh, or anything like this, because even things like uh, the light dark contrast, how well is something visible in the video is also going to affect the tracking quality. So I've played around with this, at least in open pose, changing different qualities in terms of, well, the light dark, the contrast, changing these different values throughout. And this definitely affects tracking quality. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. And that's also something uh, when you run the tracker, Play with these parameters that we've uh, we've mentioned already and kind of see because sometimes you can also adjust for some of this but yeah better quality is of course better unfortunately so yeah but it's uh, yeah it's definitely a good point wearing glasses wearing glasses really depends so for face tracking uh, it definitely makes it very difficult but it can work i'm going to say with uh when i've tried it on myself for example 
uh, it picks up my eyebrows usually, but then my eye movements are a bit spottier, um, but it has been improved a bit as well. So for example, the Connect also has uh, face tracking and that uh, my beard also made it basically not know that my mouth was doing anything, whereas open face does better with that. So there's, uh, yeah, you have to kind of play with these different options, I think, to see what's going to work best for you. Okay. So uh, uh, only the Frank Monk, please. Do you have the GitHub response? Since you're sharing already, could you just go to the uh, repo real fast? And then I, because you're sharing all your screen, right? Yeah. So uh, we we don't have a lot of time for Frank Mocap. Frank Mocap is quite a heavy system that uses your graphics card, uh, and it's it's one of the heaviest uh, 3D motion tracking right now, uh, and it's uh, it's also a high performing one. But um, we also made a module. I'll show it real quick. Where uh, once you have set that up. So we have in the module a link to a Windows installation, uh, YouTube uh, example, and you see actually what what how uh, how much of the dependencies you have to do. But you're you're being led through uh, uh, through the um, uh, Frank mocap installation uh, step by step. So follow follow that. Don't forget to uh, miss any of the steps because that will actually. Uh, um, will not be good. <laughs> and um, what, it, what, what it does is what we provide for the script, often you have, finally you have something running and then you're producing the motion tracking and then you end up with a bunch of different files uh, that you still don't know what to do with. And we have made uh, a, um, a specific module where you can just take the frames that are being produced and produce a video as well and a time series. So I'm not going to get into that. It's it's on the website, but uh, I think also all things are rather fast here, right? We cannot cover anything, but it's important that the the, the goal of the Envision Toolbox is it, it's just there. You can just tinker with it. You can email the authors of the script, and you can uh, try to fool around with it yourself, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think we, we this is enough for now. It's a lot of information. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see the Frank Monk. Okay, yeah, so indeed, a lot of information, but you can definitely get back to us about any of this. I think now we're going to go into our lunch break, if I'm not mistaken. So then we will return to you in one hour. No? In 45 minutes, 40 minutes, okay. I've used some of your lunch time, I think, to talk about motion tracking, but hopefully that was... Yes, fed you with knowledge. So I hope it digests well. <laughs> and we'll see you in the next session. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.